All right. Hi, everybody. Uh, hopefully you can see my screen. Good morning. Good afternoon. Good evening to everyone. I think we are ready to get rolling here. So welcome to this webinar today on rapidly prototyping environmental monitoring IoT devices. And there is, yes, admittedly a lot going on in that title, but we are planning on touching on all these concepts that we talk about um, throughout our time together today. So starting really with this idea of rapid prototyping in the IoT and what that really means when developing IoT prototypes and how connectivity, you know, the eye of the IoT should be brought into the equation much earlier maybe than we normally do. Now, thanks to our friends at Limnotech and Clean Earth Rovers, we're going to hear how they are developing their environmental monitoring devices using a lot of these rapid prototyping ideals. Now, first, a few brief logistics for the webinar today. We will be answering your questions at the end, but you don't have to wait until then to ask. We're all here to answer any questions that may come up during the webinar, so go ahead and enter them in the Q&A window as they pop into your head. Uh, we are also recording this, and we'll send out a link to the recording in the next day or so. And where will that recording be? Well, on YouTube, of course. Here's my official plug to check out all of our video content, and, and of course, you know, subscribe to said Blues Wireless channel at this URL. So what are we actually going to be talking about today? Well, we're going to start with IoT connectivity options, the different choices and which ones maybe make the most sense as we develop our prototype. We're also going to take a closer look at Blues Wireless and how we are helping to solve wireless IoT. Even better, as mentioned, we're going to get to hear directly from our friends at Clean Earth Rovers and Limnotech to get an inside look at the really the business and engineering of their IoT environmental monitoring solutions. So first, I want to do some introductions, starting with myself. My name is Rob Lauer. I'm Director of Developer Relations here at Blues Wireless. Joining me today is TJ Van Tol, who is a Principal Developer Advocate here at Blues. I'm also super happy to have Michael Ahrens here from Clean Earth Rovers. Michael is co-founder and CEO. Along with Michael from Clean Earth Rovers is co-founder and CTO, Jonathan Rosales. And finally, Ed Verhamey is here from Limnotech to talk about their spin on environmental monitoring with the IoT. So we've got some great content coming up for you today. Now, when we got together to discuss this webinar, we kind of landed on this message of rapid prototyping. Now, as a novice IoT engineer myself, I know that when I've prototyped some projects and put them up on Hackster, like the place I traditionally get most easily wrapped around the axle, if you will, is with connectivity. And of course, connectivity to me really is the IoT, and it's unfortunately too often an afterthought. And I guess I argue that connectivity should be at the forefront of what we are considering before we even start our prototypes, as it can pay off massive dividends to avoid, you know, retrofitting and refactoring down the road. So my personal take on rapid prototyping starts with optimizing the I and the IoT, right? Establishing connectivity in the earliest stages. But today we have choices, maybe too many choices when it comes to connectivity, right? We can find ourselves paralyzed by having too many options with no clear path forward. So let's look at some specific deployment related considerations and see how some typical connectivity options can play into our decision. It starts with communication range, right? How close to a gateway does the device have to be? Are there indoor, outdoor, line of sight considerations? Power efficiency, is the hardware connected to a consistent and reliable power source, right? Or is it off grid? Is it connected to solar or battery? How long does the device have to live on battery? What about availability? Is it okay if my device shuts down completely in the event of a local power failure? Or should it continue to record or even send data while on a backup power source. And data throughput, of course, like how much data am I pulling, pushing? How frequently does my solution require low latency between the device, the cloud, and beyond, right? Is it okay if the, our data arrives to the cloud at hourly or daily intervals? And finally, end user experience. How is my solution going to be deployed in the field? Is it a consumer installable product that requires setup by a non-technical user or you know, is it okay if the wireless setup requires an installer or someone familiar with network configs? So it's all to me a bit overwhelming uh, because there is no silver bullet. There is no one size fits all when it comes to connectivity. Each has its own set of pros and cons, you know, between cellular, LoRaWAN, Wi-Fi, there's myriad options and potential pitfalls, right? Physical enclosures, geographic locations, device portability, all that kind of stuff. You know, where Wi-Fi is great in some high bandwidth scenarios, 
It can also fail miserably in low power scenarios. Likewise, cellular can be amazing for its reach, but historically has been really difficult to program. So I wanted to look a little more closely at a few of the more popular wireless options. So Wi-Fi, of course, has come a long way in terms of speed, reliability. There's even some new protocols coming out. The 802.11ah standard uh, is focused on low power consumption, which will be great for IoT. However, we're still a ways away from that being uh, kind of more mainstream. So when does Wi-Fi become a good choice? Like, obviously, if your solution requires high bandwidth or low latency, streaming video is a great example. Um, if there is ample Wi-Fi coverage without the need of switching access points, it's great as well. However, as mentioned, sometimes, you know, if you are, if you have a deployment that is handled by non-technical users, that Wi-Fi config can be tedious, home routers can be unreliable. If you are connected to unmanaged networks and you're sending sensitive data, that can get really tricky when it comes to privacy and security concerns. And as mentioned, you know, sometimes with um, uh, depending, of course, on the Wi-Fi module you're using, the power consumption can be a little high. And also, of course, a local Wi-Fi router can't function without power. So if you lose local power, you generally use your network connection as well. What about cellular? Well, specifically with cellular, I want to focus on LTEM and NB-IoT, as those are the two that are most commonly used with IoT um, solutions. At a high level, LTEM is generally the faster of the two, and it's compatible with existing LTE infrastructure. Whereas NB-IoT has a wider theoretical range, but is not quite as popular globally, but still does exist in, in quite a few places. So when does cellular make sense? Well, when uptime is essential, right? Cellular networks are ubiquitous around the world, generally very reliable, uh, seamless global coverage, more or less, right? Data security, uh, if you're doing it the right way, if you're working with cellular providers and using custom APNs, the data doesn't even need to travel on the public internet. It can go directly from the carrier to the cloud provider. And low power, no power scenarios, right? Cellular add-ons, again, when done correctly, can consume very little power. And the nice thing is cellular networks are still available, generally speaking, should local power go out. However, if the solution requires high bandwidth or low latency, again, like streaming video or pushing images, Cellular, and when I, again, when I talk about cellular, I'm talking about narrowband cellular, not a great choice. Or um, again, low latency I mentioned, but the, the other thing I was going to mention is like voice over LTE. That's not going to work um, if you're on an, on an NB-IoT network. Finally, I wanted to talk about LoRaWAN. So if you're not familiar, LoRa, not, not LoRaWAN, LoRa stands for long range radio. Uh, it's an open standard networking layer for that's really gaining popularity in the EU. Um, LoRa really aims to solve the traditional IoT dilemma of balancing low power with long-range communication requirements. So LoRa is the physical layer and LoRa WAN is the network layer. Now, in ideal conditions, LoRa devices can communicate with LoRa WAN gateways from 5 to 15 kilometers away, which is pretty amazing. In practice, physical obstacles like trees and buildings, etc., can really disrupt data transmission. So LoRa requires a, a really great network of physical gateways to be effective. So when does LoRa work? Well, uh, transport layer security is baked in. Um, so it uses uh, AES CCM encryption by default, which is fantastic. Like NB-IoT or LTEM, if you're trying to hit that sweet spot of low power and wide range deployments, it works well. Um, low power again. And um, when does it not work? Well, if you need a uniform global solution, meaning if you're going to deploy something across the globe, problem with LoRa is that it operates on different frequency bands in different regions. Um, likewise, if you are deploying outside the EU, the, the deployment of these LoRaWAN gateways is more scattered. Uh, again, like with narrowband cellular, even when like when higher medium bandwidths are required, LoRaWAN kind of fails because data is spent, sent in very small chunks at a time. And even country-specific regulations limit how often data can be sent upstream or downstream. Now, I just cover these three, and I'm not here to spread any FUD, any fear, uncertainty, doubt about any of the three. I'm just trying to give like an honest, uh, my honest opinion of kind of where we're at and how there is no magical silver bullet here. Um, but I think we can take deep breath because I think we know all will be okay. And this is where Blues Wireless enters the story to hopefully help solve some of these problems. So at Blues, we are hyper-focused on making wireless IoT really more accessible and easier to use. So we're trying to authentically solve 
some of the previous issues I mentioned around cellular. Now, full, full disclosure, we do have a Wi-Fi solution as well and a LoRa-based product coming soon. And so again, I mentioned these because I'm not here to say that cellular with blues is it, that silver bullet, right? You have to take in a, into account your own solutions requirements and choose accordingly. That being said to me, blues is becoming the easy button, if you will, of wireless IoT, helping people to reach that prototype stage faster than ever before. And we're really getting there by providing hardware and services that back up this message of making wireless IoT easier for developers and more affordable for all. So if that is our core mission, how do we really make that happen? Well, our focus is very much on security, securing data the moment, from the moment it's acquired by a sensor all the way through to landing on your cloud application. All of our solutions are low power out of the box to the tune of eight microamps when idle. We are also a very, very developer-focused company, so our dev experience is a top priority, um, and I think you'll see that play out in TJ's demo. Quickly zooming in on our hardware, the note card is the core of what we provide. It is a low power system on module, measuring a little 30 by 35 millimeters there. It does have that M.2 edge connector at the bottom for embedding in your project. And as mentioned, there are both cellular and Wi-Fi variants of the note card. The cellular one does include GPS as well. Cellular one comes prepaid with 500 megabytes of global data, 10 years of global service. You can top them up with more data if you need them. The API, so the way you interact with the note card is all JSON. So gone are the days of those archaic AT commands to manage your cellular modem. And we also have SDKs available for a variety of popular languages. And there are note card varieties that work globally, again, using those two protocols I mentioned earlier and Cat1 as well. So that's what note card brings to the table. But just as importantly, though, you should know what you don't need when you're using the note card. You don't need your own SIM or mobile plan. The note card comes with an embedded SIM. Likewise, to work with the cellular radio, as mentioned, you're not issuing AT commands. You're not rolling your own security. Everything comes with an integrated um, ST safe secure element baked in. Um, for firmware updates, you can update note card and host microcontroller firmware over the air. And while there's always some type of power management you're going to have to do, all the components on the note card were chosen because they are low power by default, as are all the default configs in the firmware. And securely sending data to your cloud endpoint is baked in and quite simple. So again, developer experience, super important for us, which again is why everything is JSON in and JSON out with the note card API. As a quick example, if you want to get your note cards GPS location, you simply call card.location and it'll return your location with some additional metadata. The rest of the API is very similar to this. And finally, just to help visualize where the note card and, and note hub, which is our cloud service, sit in your IoT solution, I want to walk you through a quick diagram here. So you bring your microcontroller, your single board computer, your sensors, you use your language, whatever you want to use. We don't dictate any of those things. You're going to compose packets of data uh, in JSON format that we call notes. Now these notes are then queued, they're stored on the note card, and at a cadence you specify, they are securely synced with our cloud service NoteHub. Now NoteHub does not exist to store your data, it exists to securely route your data on to your cloud app of choice. So that could be AWS, Azure, Google Cloud, or an IoT provider like a Losant or UbiDots or Datacake. So uh, communication also, I should mention, with the note card is a two-way street. You can reverse this process for inbound communications as well. Now, with that kind of blitz of a high-level summary of uh, connectivity options and Blue's Wireless, I wanted to pass the mic over to TJ Van Toll, who's going to give a brief tech demo. Then we're going to hear from Michael, Jonathan, and Ed on their journeys with environmental, mon environmental monitoring. So TJ, I will stop sharing and pass it over to you. Yeah, thanks, Rob. So I'll take it over just because I want to quickly give you a look at what the hardware actually looks like outside of a slide, just because I think it's important for seeing how these these things work. And then also as Ed, Jonathan, and Michael talk about their projects, just so you have a little bit of context for what the hardware looks like and how it works. So first of all, this is the note card. This is the cellular and Wi-Fi variants of it. Uh, this is a system on module. It's about 30 by 35 millimeters, which hopefully you can get a rough sense of how big, how big that is compared to my hand. 
Uh, these are designed to be embeddable into pretty much any IoT project through these M2 edge connectors on the side. And to make that process easy, because again, we want to help you get up and running quickly, we also make a series of note carriers. And I'll bring one over here. This is the note carrier A. The note carriers are designed to easily accept a note card and allow you to do things like for example, the Note Carrier A has onboard cellular and GPS antennas. Uh, it has JST connectors over here for putting in LiPo, LiPo batteries. Uh, there's quick connectors if you want to start working with quick peripherals quite easily. Uh, so that is the A. We also make the Note Carrier AF, which similar concept, a lot of the same features. Uh, the one difference with the AF is it has this feather compatible header sockets on the side. So if you have a Feather-based MCU that you want to use alongside the note card, it makes it really easy to slot that in, start communicating with a note card, uh, put this out in the field and start working uh, with your project right away. And the last one I'll show is I've got a note carrier Pi here as well, which is a Pi hat that sits on top of a Raspberry Pi. So if you're a fan of the Raspberry Pi, uh, you can get a note carrier Pi, slot it on top, uh, put it in a note card and get started working with cellular on the Pi as well. Now, the last thing I'll show is on the side of these note carriers, all of them have a micro USB slot as well. And what I'm going to do with that is actually switch my, my camera back so you can see me again and show my screen. Make sure I pick the right number. There we go. And I'm going to take my note carrier A with a note card and plug it into my laptop through that USB slot that I just showed. And the reason I'm gonna do that is because on our development site, which is dev.blues.io, uh, I would recommend, so if you are new to Blues, the first thing that we recommend you do is head to this quick start tutorial that we have for the note card. And one cool thing that you can do through our site is actually connect to your note card directly in Chromium-based web browsers. We use something called the Web Serial API to communicate. Um, and actually through this USB connection, I can actually start sending requests directly to my note card. And so I'd recommend going through this on your own time. If you do have a note card, I'm gonna give you like the, the cliff notes, the, the short version of it here today. And the first request that you'll want to send in the tutorial here is a card.version request, which I'll just go ahead and send real quick so you can see what this looks like. Uh, it's just going to give me some basic firmware information about the note card that I'm using. But I will point out a few things. So first of all, Rob showed this in slides, but I think it's kind of cool. The API for the note card is JSON, so I'm sending JSON in. In this case, I'm sending send a request of card.version. And the output, the response I get back is also JSON-based as well. So I could get this in my host, uh, do whatever it is I needed to do, depending on the type of request. So all of the requests for the note card work this way. You can send them in the browser like I'm doing when you're learning how the note card works, when you're doing some quick testing. But all of these commands can also be sent through a CLI that we offer for Windows, for Mac OS, and for Linux. And more importantly, they can all be sent through SDKs that we offer for platforms like Arduino, C, C++, Python, CircuitPython, Go, TinyGo. Uh, so when you're ready to build your production applications, you build them around sending these requests to the note card. Uh, and building whatever interesting project that you have in mind. And chances are those projects revolve around data. So the next thing I wanna show is how you could take some data that you're collecting locally through some sensor or whatever and start pushing that up to the cloud. And to do that, you'll next need to set up the note, the note cards cloud backend note hub. As Rob said, note hub is a, a sort of a thin cloud layer that the note hub knows how to speak to out of the box. The first time you will go in, you'll need to create an account and also create a project, which is just a logical place to group your devices and the data that you're working with. And I already set one up here today to save us a little bit of time. And what I've got to do is grab this identifier because the next command I'm going to have to run, if I scroll down a little bit, is this hub.set command. And I just need to paste in if I can use my keyboard correctly, there we go. My product, what we call our product UID, this identifier that comes here. And then I also need to initialize a sync. 
So we designed the note card to be low power friendly by default. And one of the things that means is we try to avoid doing sort of power intensive operations. And one of those would be communicating, sort of turning on a cellular modem and sending data across a network. So by default, we try to defer those operations to an interval that you can configure, but you can also just trigger it um, if you need data to go for, for a demo or for, uh, at some point you need that sync to happen. You can uh, sort of explicitly tell the note card to do it through a hub.sync request. And once you do, what I should be able to do is go back to my backend, uh, refresh here, and I now have a project, knows about my device, knows about my location and whatnot. And once you've made this connection, at this point, you're now ready to start collecting data and pumping that up to the cloud through the note card. So as a next step, I'll go down here and run the note.add request. Note.add is just a really simple way of adding more or less an arbitrary JSON object. So in this case, this is hard-coded data, but this is basically simulating having some sort of temperature and humidity sensor hooked up, pushing that up to the cloud. Once again, data is not going to be sent immediately. I have to run a hub.sync to sort of kick off that request, get that data up to the cloud. And once it does, it'll appear in this events list. It is over cellular, so there is going to be some latency. So we might have to wait a second for that to come through. You can also run a sub a hub sync status to get like status information. So in this case, it's connecting. So we'll give it a second for that data to come through. And in general, I'm not going to go too much further down into this tutorial. Again, this is something that if you are new to Blues, if this is the first time you're seeing and hearing this, I would recommend going through this, checking this out. The rest of the tutorial will walk you through how to take data from the Note Hub side of things. So we've been sending data from the Note Card up to Note Hub, which our data should be there at this point. And there it is. So this was going from my like physical Note Card sitting here on my desk up to Note Hub. But you can send data, you send, can send like uh, commands, variables down in the opposite direction as well. So if you need to remotely change uh, a host that you've got out in the field somewhere, you can do that through either the Note Hub UI, or there's an API that runs around everything around here that you could automate as well, uh, if you need to do some remote configuration as well. That's like the, the really quick version. The, the sort of last thing I'll point out is to learn more, this guides and tutorial section has a lot of different stuff that you can check out from collecting more real world sensing, sensor data to routing your data out of NoteHub into your cloud provider of choice, setting up a note card as an asset tracker. There's a lot that you can do. The very last thing I want to show before I turn it over to these guys to hear about some of their projects is a more complete version of this sensor tutorial just so you can get just at least a glimpse at what more of a real world solution with the note card looks like. You'll note that I'm sending the same sort of requests that I was sending in my browser. But in this case, I'm using one of our SDKs. So this is Arduino. This is using the Arduino SDK uh, to set a hub.set. But the, the syntax for the request is identical, right? I'm hub.setting. I'm again setting a product. If I scroll down a little bit, I'm getting a sense uh, temperature and humidity reading. And then I'm doing the same note.add request that I did earlier to actually push that data up. And this, this is Arduino, but this could be a Python script running on a Raspberry Pi. This could be a, a circuit Python writing on some, running on some sort of feather-based MCU. Uh, one of the things that's important to us with a note card is trying to make our stuff work on whatever hardware, whatever setup you have. That's why we offer a wide variety of different tools and SDKs. But I think that's, that's sort of like the whirlwind tour. Again, dev.blues.io is where you want to check out if you want to learn any more of this. But at this point, I'm going to turn things over to Michael so we can hear about some real projects built with this sort of stuff, because I think that's going to be a lot more interesting. Michael, you want to take it from here? Sure. And thank you, um, Rob and TJ, for seeing kind of everything up and, and going through the background and explanation. Um, I mean, we're here because we support Blues and everything that you guys are working on, um, and they're great solutions. So uh, with that, I guess I'll jump in quickly and give some background context to what Clean Earth Rovers is, and then um, some of the solutions that we're working on that we're using Blues uh, for connectivity with, and then I'll toss it over to Jonathan, um, who can give some more uh, granular details on, on why we chose Blues and, and how it's been working for us so far. Um, so to get started, uh, Clean Earth Rovers is 
um, an early stage startup that Jonathan and I've been working on basically since the pandemic and then with a few other founders um, all the way back to 2019. So uh, it's something that it's been a long time in the making and rapid prototyping for us uh, took place in the bulk of 2021. Um, and so our technology went through a number of different iterations and cycles and uh, even so much so that near the end or the fall of 2021, we decided to add in this uh, data piece to our value proposition. And that's where Blues really started to come into play with our technology. So with that, I'll uh, share some more about what it is that we're working on. And so... Clean Earth Rovers is focused on solving marine debris in our coastal waterways. Uh, every year, 11 million tons of plastics and man-made pollutants enter our oceans. And out of that, we estimate that 6.6 .6 million stays within um, coastlines. And that has a heavy impact on the efficiencies of coastal businesses, such as marinas, harbors, and yacht clubs around the entire U.S. and the world. Um, so they're constantly you know, dealing with this and, and trying to keep their customers happy at the same time. Um, and meanwhile, we also see both in uh, salt and fresh bodies of water all over the, the U.S. is just a massive amount of nutrient pollution that causes uh, pollution events like marine die-offs like you see in this picture that also continue to affect uh, local tourism economies and local businesses. And so when we really started to work on clean earth rovers, we took a step back and as I mentioned, tried to really figure out who the parties are that deal with the problem the most, right? Who, who has these pain points when it comes to um, man-made debris and pollution being in the water. And what we found was Marinas are actually skimming by hand for upwards of two hours a day uh, with more than one person. And uh, that's costing them quite a bit on an annual basis, as well as uh, some of these other chemical pollutants that are in the water is costing them, you know, upwards of $5,000 per report with Coast Guard. Um, it has cost some customers and a lot of the municipalities and coastal areas actually have reached out to marinas to see if they are engaging in any water quality um, campaign where they're actually collecting the data. So what we've realized when we started to hear this from marina customers was that there's some sort of dichotomy between um, these private small businesses and the actual you know, local governments themselves that are dealing and overseeing these waterways. Um, so with that, we started to talk to different homeowner associations and municipalities that were um, connected to water. And what we found is that many of them are collecting water samples, but the common practice at the moment is to be collecting samples by hand. And if they are collecting um, samples using remote monitoring instruments, in many cases, um, it's costing them upwards of $40,000 per buoy. Um, and so if they're not uh, collecting this water data or, or having some sense of awareness of what's going on, they run the risk of uh, facing a pollution event like a harmful algal bloom. And annually, it's costing U.S. coastlines and tourism economies over $4 billion. Um, and they also run the risk of you know, endangering citizens and, and whatnot in the area by hospitalization and death. And so that's when we um, started to tie all of this together and we said, okay, well, we want to make a, uh, a Roomba for coastal waters. So we've created an autonomous debris skimming device that can collect the man-made pollutants and the pollutants that you can see off of the surface of the water and streamline that entire process for businesses. Um, and then we also created a separate monitoring device. And these monitoring devices are attached to all of our debris skimmers, but they can be standalone monitoring devices as well. 
Um, and then all of the data that's coming from each of these technologies is being aggregate, aggregated into one user interface. Um, and so here is actually our first rover in the water at a marina in Cincinnati. This is our awesome engineer, Rob, who's taking it off the trailer. Um, and so some of the ways that this works is it's a completely electric vehicle that can collect up to 150 pounds of trash. Um, and it's fully autonomous. So through waypoint navigation, um, and, and this is a huge key for us when it comes to telemetry and connectivity, is being able to access these devices in really remote areas where some marinas are located um, and being able to tell it through our cloud platform where it needs to go. Uh, and then it also uses a series of you know, reusable and disposable bags for uh, maintenance with the customer and provides the same data services that our data pod uses. Um, and so this is also a uh, solar powered and electric uh, product where it monitors up to six key metrics for water quality at the surface level. Um, and what we hope to do is that as we continue to expand our uh, deployments with both pods and uh, rovers that we actually build heat maps of data that are so dense, we can provide predictive analytics to uh, coastal regions around the US about when pollution events will actually happen. Um, and then they're all IoT enabled. So, so with that being said, I will let Jonathan jump into it um, to tell you a little bit more about how these solutions have kind of come together with Blue's Wireless and, and give you more of a uh, granular dive into the technology. Thanks, Michael. <clears throat> hey, everyone. So uh, yeah, just uh, diving a bit deeper. I think uh, the main benefits uh, for us when we were when we were prototyping and doing all this uh, technology scouting. Um, I originally started with a couple different cellular modules uh, and in our application, since we were talking about outdoor IoT devices, cellular was the right option. We looked a little bit into uh, LoRaWAN, uh, but honestly, that still requ requires gateways that you need to have nearby and so on. So uh, cellular was the right, uh, the right choice at that moment. So... As I was testing, honestly, the big, the big pluses that I found in uh, Blues and why I leaned towards uh, using uh, the note card was first the low power consumption in our particular application. We want to have this device itself being self powered and just have enough energy through solar technologies. And as we know, solar is not as efficient as it uh, as as we want it. We're talking about like a 20% roughly in the best scenarios. <laughs> um, so that actually makes a big constraint on your application. And that's why uh, being able to see how, like if, uh, if you've done electrical work, eight microamps uh, of consumption when it's idling, that's, that's amazing. <laughs> that's honestly really, really low. It's something that you would definitely want. And so that was the first... Uh, attractive point there. And then honestly, the the cars themselves, the note car, the note carriers are really well designed, my uh, my personal opinion. And they incorporate other aspects that we wanted in our devices, such as the GPS and the solar connectivity and the battery. And it has a power administration uh, system embedded into it. So that's just a lot of uh, electrical stuff that and electronics that makes it really attractive as a development board and even as a solution to it just integrating. And, but the, the cherry on top was uh, Node Hub itself. Um, so the platform, like being able to just make it so easy to interact with our cloud uh, and our cloud databases, that was uh, really nice. And um, Adam, for those of you who have not used Node Hub yet, I recommend looking when you set up your routes, it also offers a JSON ADA expression editor. So uh, so in our case, and like as uh, Rob mentioned before, with cellular, your uh, bandwidth and the amount of data that you can send 
it's really limited. So, and the more the more data you want to send, you run into more constraints. So being able to summarize that that I like you yourself, like you're developing it, you'll be able to know exactly what you're sending. So you can minimize, like, just enclose that as much as possible. And then in NodeHub, you can add all the fancy stuff that you want. You can edit and like aggregate and do all the different uh, different options that you have there. And uh, that does that will not take a bandwidth data or anything from your device itself. So that's uh, just another post processing option. And then it like you can do that uh, not have itself and send the um, the post process data to your cloud uh, instance. So that's uh, that's just another feature that's uh, part of it. And then the price is really attractive uh, compared to other solutions. There's some also all their budget solutions that you'll find, but honestly, you're getting a lot of <laughs> benefits out of this. Um, so it's it's definitely a really really good uh, option to use for your connectivity. And honestly, for other applications, we we don't have in our company yet. So, but uh, I well, I get the notifications of like the Wi-Fi carriers now, the Wi-Fi cards and all that. So they're, they're really good. And plus you have the, uh, I know TJ mentioned before the development portal and all the guy, like quick start guides and tutorials. Um, that's what I've used in my, in our case, uh, I have back coding background or so on and so on. And uh, JSON Ada and uh, JSON itself, it's really easy to learn if you have some coding background. And if you don't, uh, if you follow a few tutorials, nothing too complex. So, um, yeah, those are the main components for me and why we chose this. And I think as well, just to, to build off of that, like Jonathan, you mentioned some of the alternatives that we looked at, like Laura One and whatnot, and recognizing that. Um, from a commercialization standpoint and trying to get wide, widespread uh, data access out there, um, the amount of gateways that would need to be installed and, and things like that, and those extra added costs are not um, attractive for a small, small business that's trying to scale fast. And um, so Blues has really cut out a lot of, I would say the fat in the process and uh, helped us to, you know, provide the level of data that we're looking to provide, but also the um, affordability that we're looking to provide and, and kind of help disrupt this uh, space. So. Yeah. And with that said, I think uh, we'll pass it all to Ed. Great, thanks guys. Let me share my screen here. And let me jump to the top. Oh, there we go. So I'm going to um, kind of a similar topic here. So I think, but you know, both of our groups are talking about how to monitor water. I think I I'm approaching it a little bit more from a I, I say a consulting standpoint, in that we see a lot of people's problems, and we're paid to do some custom one-off things. And it's you know it's apparent. With the technology that we have available, um, once we figure out something once, you know, the ability to, to make five or ten of those, uh, it, it's, it's a lot cheaper, it's a lot easier. So I, I've, I've been really interested in this sort of scale down uh, to a larger quantity. And I, I, I always want to try and ground what we're doing in, in societal relevance and societal problems. So here's a really great graphic that was created after the Toledo water crisis in 2014. So, you know, the algae that almost ate Toledo, there was a harmful toxic algal bloom that contaminated the city's water supply. And, you know, the connection of water into people's everyday lives. I just saw Jonathan taking a drink, he's drinking water. That water came from a lake, river, stream, and what's happening in those systems. And it's it's it, it's really immense, the, the scale of these environmental phenomenons and how they impact water so you know in right like the literally the week after the toledo water crisis we took uh research sensors expensive 
but we knew we could put one station right next to the water intake. So we sort of grabbed research instruments, patched them together like we would in a custom buoy and stuck it out there. And that buoy's been out there for seven years uh, straight now, monitoring Lake Erie. Um, we know the phenomenon is much larger than just within hundreds of feet of the water intake. This is, this is a huge scale phenomenon. Uh, this is Lake Erie here. And since the Toledo water crisis, we've instrumented Lake Erie with hundreds and hundreds of sensors. Uh, now, not all of these are real time. Some of these are bottom deployed, uh, actually fish trackers. We're, we're tracking thousands of fish moving around Lake Erie. It turns out the fishery is more valuable than the water treatment plant industry. So, um, I, but it's, it just surprised me since that crisis, how much we've focused on technology as a solution, given how big the phenomenon is. Uh, when I start to unpack like all the components here, if you imagine on the left of this diagram is the lake, river, stream, groundwater, and as a, I just say like a science technologist or engineering for water technology, you're going to have to make a bunch of decisions. You're going to have to figure out how do I, what sensor is measuring that phenomenon. And then now you're into a whole electrical mechanical supply chain here of how does that how does that data get uh, read, averaged, coded over to a data logger, which can do some uh, coding work. And how do you how you get that to the internet? How do you throw that data packet into the air and 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 magically picked up in the internet? And then how do you get it in front of the user's eye? So all the way on the right is going to be a person. Um, or it could be a machine um, learning algorithm that's doing additional work on it or something. So I, I, I tried to focus uh, on the relevant pieces here for the sort of the Blues I.O. technology. And you'll notice that wasn't a mistake that I extended the, this red box into that data logger box here. It's, it's, you know, when you get into the microprocessor world, it's, it's messy. It can be a lot of work. It's a lot of skill that as it, you know, I, I chose environmental engineering because I didn't have to do any programming or know anything about circuits. And <laughs> so, I, you know, when you guys use the word developer, I hardly say I'm a developer, but man, I can certainly pick up this stuff and use it. Um, so that's, that's kind of where we approach these problems. And as, as we step through these decisions, um, there's going to be cost, scalability, manufacturability, I'm most interested in batch production. Can we go from one to five? And can we start to test our ability to monitor that phenomenon and prove a value worth case before we're making a thousand of them or something? So uh, the, the telemetry piece, as we heard, it, it, it's super important. It, it's, it's a rapidly changing landscape with different companies, networks coming online almost every year. And it, it's been really challenging as a, as a, uh, as a um, use case developer, which one to pick, how to, how to determine, you know, do I want to tie myself to this technology or that technology? I've kind of come to the conclusion of uh, none of them are perfect, and I want the ability to change which one I can use as I move from maybe prototyping to full-scale build-out, depending on what the ultimate um, large scale build out is so you know how do we, how do we go from the 50 that we built to demo something and understand and if if someone wants to go to a full blown build out uh, you'll really have to seriously look at that telemetry piece again but we just have so many options um, so I don't I Laura is great cellular is great uh, it just depends what you're trying to do uh, with it um, and. You know, I showed that really expensive buoy. Um, we can really get, if, if you pick one parameter, let's say it's turbidity, and you want to measure that everywhere. Now, what's the cheapest way to get a turbidity measurement back to the internet? You're, you're going to cheapen everything along the whole way. Cheap MCU, uh, cheap radios. And cheap is a bad word. I just start saying efficient. You know, what's the most efficient way to do that? Uh, and you can use the word value. Um, they certainly end up being cheap, but it's not because they're low quality. Um, 
so just one demonstration and we literally did this last week where we got a phone call someone said hey there's an oil spill uh how do we measure the stream for oil and water and i i said well we can grab a note card we can just slide it into the note carrier b which gives us some little bit of power management and control and a little bit different pinout for us from that edge connector um, we we also had printed what i what people call an uh, interposer board. So it's just moving some pins around. Uh, we've, we've been using a Arduino environmental data logger for a while, which is super flexible for us. That has our already, uh, uh, it's a XB pinout uh, for a communications module, Wi-Fi, Bluetooth. There's a whole series of these that go back to the 2000s, early 2000s with just the drop-in module for telemetry. So, you know, we just needed an interposer board to go from the note carrier to this XB format and plug it in uh, and boom, you know, we have a oil and water sensor that's sending data to the internet. And this is within, um, you know, two hours in our back shop. So, you know, it's, and it's not that we got everything from scratch here. We have some code that we can work with, uh, but, you know, it goes through that whole supply chain of um, instruments I talked about grabbing the sensor, we pick the data logger, here's the telemetry method, and here's where that, that data goes. Um, so again, I think that the ability for someone to make a phone call and say, hey, I wanna do this, and you just go into your recipe book, and, and lose is the easiest part in the middle that takes a bunch of the uncertainty away with the, the custom uh, coding and how you're gonna configure it to use these AT commands. And yeah, I know you, TJ already walked through this a little bit, but I just wanted to say, yeah, I'm not a programmer or, or even what I classify as a developer. The hardware wiring is just TXRX, power ground. That's the only thing we're going to grab off of all these other pins. You, you know, we ignore everything else. Uh, the thing manages sleep really well and power. Um, so once we do our thing, it just goes to sleep and waits till our next command. Um, programming, now this is, again, I, I would not know how to construct this sentence. But if someone shows this to me, I'm going to hone in and say, oh, this is where my two measurements would go. Temperature, 35.5 and humidity, 56.23. So I, I can always copy someone else's work. I think, you know, it's not like college where you're going to get, you know, you can't look over someone's shoulder on the test here. So I think copy and paste, I use it all the time. And it's super easy to just jump into coding. Um, and then you just think that, use that same command. And then I, TJ, you showed part of this as well, but again, there's a lot of, I think, magic that happens. You, you can go in and see all these things of where data is going and why it's going. And we have other people here that help me with uh, some of the cloud stuff. And again, when someone does it once, uh, it's easy to copy. Uh, but at a, at the like scientist level that just wants to pick something up, change a few little commands in the program and then be able to utilize this whole data pipeline has been really helpful for us. We don't have to involve the programmers in the development of environmental sensors. Um, so we can kind of just selectively uh, help them prop up a few little things on the far right here if we're doing something fancy. Um, you know, this has led us to just not be shy about doing new prototypes. We sort of focus on the things that are harder for us which include the enclosures and what sensors to pick and how much those cost. Um, and it's really a question of scale. Do we want to go from five to 10 to 100? And once we start getting into these hundreds ranges, you know, you're really down to the dollars or pennies and you're thinking about, well, you know, rather than buy Blue's note carrier B, maybe I'm going to just onboard all of those components into my own circuit board. So it's a really, trade-off with a microprocessor and, and sort of a PCB designer on what components go where. Uh, uh, so that's just a real quick overview of, you know, we're focused on environmental solutions. If, if we can use this innovative um, tech to take a, and, and this has been a persistent problem for 10, 10 years, I can certainly hone in and I've gone into the modules and manuals of cellular modems and upgraded onboard firmwares and um, I, it, I'm 
I said, I'm never going to do it again. And, and there's only been more options that, that prove that that's, that's true. And same goes for, you know, using LoRaWAN. So I think once you get to this simple, you're, you're really just trying to part, what's the, what's the data you want to send to the internet? And if you, if that's LoRaWAN, great. And there's a little module that can just drop in and throw your two little measurements to the internet. You don't have to worry about the overhead and all the, the custom connection to the telemetry system. That's a lot of handshakes and a lot of overhead that scientists just don't have to deal with. That's awesome. Thanks, Ed. Um, I want to say two things. One is that we uh, really did not pay these guys to say any of these great things about blues. So I appreciate that. Um, it was totally unprompted, I promise y'all. And uh, the second thing is that uh, copy and paste development. There's there's no shame to be had in that at all. That's how that's how I made my living. And also um, that art from the Toledo algae invasion was pretty amazing. Yes, I had not seen that yes. before either. Um, I did want to like, before we get to the q and I did want to take a moment to promote uh, the Blues Wireless Hackster page. I We did get one question about kind of more specific use case examples or guides. And I just want to refer you all here. There are quite a few, like some of these are kind of silly, but some of them are, you know, at least have a very practical core to them. So we address some use cases like machine learning, asset tracking, remote monitoring. There's a couple environmental monitoring, you know, high level use case examples in here as well. So just head there and check that out. There's a lot of good stuff on that page. And um, again, like, thank you all very much for attending. A few final notes before we jump into the Q&A. If you are curious about kind of getting started with a note card and experimenting with wireless IoT, we are offering 15% off any of our dev kits at this URL. Um, the, the discount will show up in the checkout, by the way, that confuses people. Also, be sure to check out what Clean Earth Rovers and Limnotech are up to at these URLs. And with that, I wanted to jump into some of the questions here. And feel free to ask, ask your questions if you didn't get a chance to already. And I do always strive to end these before the top of the hour. So I'll see what we can do here in, in, a, in a few minutes. But one question that, um, and this is a really good one. This comes up quite often. Like people, I think, get kind of thrown off by NoteHub, right? This idea that, well, Blues is throwing yet another like cloud service in the middle of things. And it's another point of potential failure. And it kind of freaks people out. So somebody asked a question about, can I just send data directly from my device to my cloud or to some endpoint that I created? And the answer is yes and no. The, the yes answer is that we do offer a what we call like a, a mini version of NodeHub. It's a free and open source version of NodeHub that you can stand up on your own. Um, it's very limited in functionality, but it does let you stand up your own kind of service. The reason I say no is that by default, the note card is uh, works. Um, sorry, it, it doesn't live on the public internet, right? It when you turn it on, it knows where to connect in terms of connecting to NodeHub, and it does that through private VPN tunnels. So it never lives on the public internet. So it needs a cloud-based proxy like NodeHub. So, and as Jonathan mentioned as well, like there is a lot of value that we provide in NodeHub. So I understand why people get kind of freaked out, but understand that there is a ton of value we provide in NodeHub in terms of security and with routing data and working with fleet management and firmware updates and all that kind of good stuff. So that's my pitch. Um, let's see, just looking through some other questions here. Yeah, I can, uh, Rob, Rob real, real quick yeah. on that answer. I, I certainly wouldn't recommend hard coding these sort of endpoints where your data goes first, because you know, it's, it's just a super challenge once you program these cheap devices and throw them out in the field, you if, if your endpoint changes, you got to reprogram everything. So I've, I've certainly had an issue with that. And so, again, I think it's just super nice to have that, you know, the first cloud hop you guys control and you'll always have that ability and we're just picking up from there. So again, just another sort of pile on to that advantage. Uh, Somebody asked a question about, are there any like uh, ready to deploy units? And again, the answer is yes and no, depending on what that's really, what we're, what, how you really define ready to deploy. We do offer a variety of dev kits that I mentioned, like you can get 15% off there. Um, not to sell you on that again, but we do provide those kits that kind of come with a note carrier, a note card, 
and optionally a microcontroller as well. Uh, but we don't provide units that like come with an enclosure and provide more of like a turnkey solution. I, ideally, we are kind of selling these as um, a stepping stone in your prototyping phase. So uh, a lot of folks will use a lot of our note card, note carrier combos during the prototyping phase as they scale up to maybe, you know, tens or hundreds of units. But then when they scale beyond that, they're generally spinning their own boards and using and embedding the note card directly on their boards and such. So just throwing out some disclaimers there. Um, let's see. One question that always comes up, I don't see it here, and I'm surprised it wasn't asked, is about our what we mean by global coverage. And uh, I, sh I should say that by global, we mean pretty global. I think it's like 137 plus countries that are supported by the uh, by the main uh, narrowband note card, the NBGL model that we offer. And it's all in our data sheets at dev.blues.io if you want to look up country support, uh, specific country support. And I should mention too that we do offer four, five rather different models of the note card. Uh, two of them are narrowband. One is narrowband global. One is narrowband uh, in the US. And the other ones are the wideband models. So there's a WBEX that connects to wideband networks in EMEA. And the other is WBNA, which is wideband in North America. And then the final one is the Wi-Fi note card. So there's options really for everybody depending on your use case. And let's see. There was a question, as I mentioned, there's a question about um, a specific use case. And I would refer you to our Hackster page to get any more like use case specific tutorials. Otherwise, I think we touched on all these either during the webinar itself. So uh, anybody else have any last comments or questions or anything before we wrap it up? I'd just say that if you have any blues specific questions, if you go to the blues forum, there's a link on the website. It's discuss.blues.io. That's where I'd recommend. If you post your question in there, we watch it pretty closely. So we should be able to help you out. Uh, and I also wanted to thank these guys again yeah. for, for hopping in today. This was, this was really awesome working on some really cool stuff. Absolutely. And I just wanted to plug, uh, you know, plug Twitter. So just, you know, I've, I've certainly enjoyed seeing a lot of these projects and, and being able to ask questions on Twitter as well. So cool. cool. Excellent. Well, thank you all very much uh, for attending and yeah, we'll see you around. Yeah. See you.